What's up everyone? Welcome back to my channel for another true crime video. Today's video is in collaboration with one of my favorite true crime YouTubers, formerly known as Daughter of Remus here on YouTube, none other than Kirsty Sky. Something that I really appreciate about Kirsty's channel is that it is set up in series, which makes it super, super easy to binge watch her content, which I do very often. My favorite series that she does is known as The Doe Files, and basically it's where she brings awareness to the cases of the nameless and the unidentified. I'm gonna let Kirsty tell you guys a little bit more about herself. Hi everybody, my name's Kirsty Skye. I am a Scottish true crime YouTuber. I cover all sorts of true crime content over on my channel, mainly murder mysteries, Vanished, which is about missing people, and The Doe Files, which centers around John and Jane Doe cases from across the globe. I am so excited to be able to do a collab with Mifundo. She has been a massive support to me for the longest time and I really enjoy watching her content and I know that she really enjoys watching mine and I'm just really happy that we're able to finally collaborate. This has been in the works for a couple of months now so I'm really glad that we're finally able to post our collab videos for you guys to see. So don't forget to subscribe to Mifundo's channel because her content is incredible and don't forget to pop over to my own channel to watch our collaboration over there. Today we will be covering the case of Petrus Madiba, one of the most infuriating cases that I have ever covered because of the unexpected twist. Once again, this case does have links to Abarded, but this time in the name. Madiba is what many people lovingly refer to Nelson Rolihlahla Mandela as. It is a clan name, so there is no apparent relation. As far as my research went, I could find no apparent relation between Petrus Madiba and South Africa's first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela. But to avoid confusion, we will be referring to Petrus by his first name throughout this video. By making this video, we do not intend to cause any harm to any of the families or victims affected by this case. This video is purely for educational purposes and to give the audience more information about this case. Petras Panjola Madiba was born in 1984, meaning that he grew up in officially the last decade of apartheid and arguably the most hostile and violent period of apartheid South Africa. Petras is the youngest perpetrator that we have covered thus far, so at surface level we can assume that he did not fully experience the full extent of apartheid, so it may not seem that he would be as deeply affected by it. In order to understand how he may have been influenced by this period, however, we need to take a look at what was happening in South Africa during his childhood and formative years, that is, between 1984 and 1994. Before we get into that, I know that I always speak on apartheid having an influence on the perpetrators that we see today, and specifically the serial killers that we see today. And a lot of people were affected by apartheid, millions of people in fact were affected by apartheid, experienced apartheid, are affected by it to this very day, and they did not in any way turn out to be violent perpetrators. So I am not in any way justifying his actions, I'm not in any way justifying the actions of the previous people that I have covered on this channel. It is just to give you some context and to sort of understand the deeper socio-economic circumstances that may lead to the making of these types of people. If you want a more in-depth analysis on the making of a serial killer, I highly, highly recommend Rachel Shannon's mini-series on that topic. Do keep in mind though that her series probably has very little bearing on South Africa's case because it's two completely different circumstances, so do watch that with a grain of salt, but I'm sure you can draw some parallels and similarities in that series. On the 5th of October 1984, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the non-violent struggle against apartheid. By this time, military troops and police had moved into townships and engaged in running battles with the youth. They had live ammunition. The youth was armed with stones and petrol bombs. This occupation was all in an attempt to re-establish control following the increasingly violent uprisings that had taken place since 1976. Sometime in 1984, the government, which at the time was led by the National Party, imposed a state of emergency in the country that would last for six years. On the 13th of December 1984, 
the United Nations General Assembly adopted resolutions that would lead to further sanctions on South Africa involving arms, trade, financial assistance, and military and nuclear cooperation. Announcements of sanctions and measures against South Africa endorsed by the UN Security Council would continue all the way through to and well past 1985. On the 3rd of March 1986, an anti-apartheid group of young men between the ages of 16 and 23, known as the Guguletu 7, were shot and killed by members of the South African police force. Just a few months later, on the 26th of June, a group of men, now referred to as the Mamelodi 10, were lured to their deaths in Nitverdiend by police constable Joe Mamasela, who was posing as an MK agent. The men were shot and the minibus they were travelling in was driven into a ditch and set alight. The 1989 elections would be the last race-based elections in South Africa and also the last time the National Party won a majority of the seats in Parliament. During apartheid, the South African Parliament only housed 165 MPs and only three parties were represented following the 1989 elections the National Party, the Democratic Party, and the Conservative Party. Later that year, F.W. de Klerk was sworn in as the last apartheid president after P.W. Boerter resigned. He had suffered a stroke and, due to this, decided to step down as leader of the National Party and as South African president. De Klerk's presidency will most likely be remembered for his quote-unquote revolutionary first year in office. By the end of February 1990, he had lifted the ban on several anti-apartheid organizations, released anti-apartheid activists from prison, and most notably, released Nelson Mandela on the 11th of February after he had served 27 years as a political prisoner. Before the year came to an end, he would repeal the Group Areas Act, the Land Act, the Population Registration Act, and the Separate Amenities Act. On the 15th of October 1993, de Klerk and Mandela were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for ending apartheid and bringing about the beginning of a multi-racial democratic South Africa. Two significant things happened in April of 1994. First, the 10 ethnically determined homelands of the apartheid era were incorporated into nine new provincial administrative regions, the map on screen explains how South Africa looked before and after this major event took place. On the 27th of that month, apartheid officially came to an end with the first multiracial democratic elections held in South Africa. These elections spanned over three days and the results were as follows. The former ruling party, which was basically responsible for apartheid, retained 82 seats in Parliament. Inkata Freedom Party won 43 seats, Freedom Front won 9 seats and the African National Congress won the national elections and gained 252 seats in Parliament. South African Parliament has 400 seats. In comparison, there are 650 seats in the UK's House of Commons, with Scotland being represented by just 59 of them. Finally, on the 10th of May 1994, South Africa's first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela, was sworn into office. From this point forward, black-on-black -black violence somewhat subsided and the reconstruction of the country began. So that was the absolute briefest summary of a decade of South African history. In order to make sure that this video is itself not 10 years long, we had to skip over a lot of events and a lot of details. I hope that this summary helped contextualize Petras's childhood so you can better understand the type of environment that he possibly grew up in. We are going to skip ahead in the timeline to 2003 when Petras was 19 years old. Now a young man, he found himself on the wrong side of the law and laid the groundwork for his future crimes when he was convicted of assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. There is no information about his sentencing or where he served his term. After the liberation of black people in South Africa, a lot changed in the workforce, but some things remained the same. 
One such thing was young black men and sometimes even women taking on jobs as migrant workers in farms around South Africa. Groblesdal is a beautiful farming town in the province of Limpopo. It is the second largest irrigation settlement in South Africa, preceded only by the Val Hartz irrigation scheme in the Northern Cape. Due to the water supply, a great climate and good soil conditions, Groblesdal makes for an amazingly fertile agricultural region. The development of this fertile land obviously gave rise to many farms, which created plenty of opportunities for permanent and migrant job seekers. In 2012, the Hroblesdal community was gripped with fear as women started disappearing after doing ordinary tasks. Women on their way to work, shopping, or even seeking job opportunities would just disappear without a trace. On the 29th of March, Portia Moella left her home to buy groceries in Grobersdal, where she met a man who promised her work. The state of unemployment in South Africa has never been the greatest, even more so for black women. When this man presented her with an opportunity to change the circumstances of her family, she took it without hesitation. She sent the groceries home with a friend and left with this man to pursue the alleged job opportunity. Over a week later, on the 8th of April, someone on a farm who was collecting firewood, when they came across a body under some shrubs. This was the body of Moella, who was in the later stages of decomposition and had been strangled to death. Two months later, 32-year-old Ranconi Monica Malalo left her 11-year-old daughter at home in Masakineng village so she could go away for the weekend of the 8th of June. Her family grew concerned when they didn't hear from her by the weekend's end, but on the 16th of June, her decomposing body was found at Crocodile's Drift Farm on Schumann Road, naked from the waist down and strangled with a piece of cloth. 22-year-old Tandy Masagela Maiola left her work on the 7th of July. She had a young son who she left in the care of her mother. She never returned home to her son. On the 19th of July, her burnt body was found in a field on B50 Michelone Farm. She too was naked from the waist down and all that survived the fire was a piece of shirt she had been wearing on the last day she was seen alive by her family and a leather belt tightened around her neck. Due to how badly burned her body was, she had to be identified by way of DNA. Not long after the discovery of Maiola's body, the decomposing body of Maple Maria Madlala was found by two women collecting firewood, covered by tall branches. She was also naked from the waist down and had been hogtied with a rope. This means that her hands and ankles were continuously tied with rope around her neck so that she struggled to free herself she would be simultaneously strangling herself. Matlala had left her house a week earlier to go to work in Groblersdal. Her family never heard from her again. At this point, the community was in a panic. The media was covering these findings on a near regular basis and had even reported the possibility of a serial killer in Groblersdal. So on the 13th of September, a task team was formed to investigate these murders. They met at Groblersdal SAPS and started going through the dockets. They then contacted the Forensic Science Lab to follow up on the victim's identification because at this point none of the bodies had actually been identified yet because they were in such late stages of decomposition. They approached neighbouring police stations to look for open investigations that showed any similarities and they visited the crime scenes and the local mortuary. 
They really worked hard as soon as they were established. Their hard work paid off because later that day, the FSL informed them that a good sample of DNA was found on one of the bodies and that they could possibly be able to identify a suspect from this. While all of this was taking place, the semi-naked body of two-year-old Pulojo Mugwena was found in a wheat field on a farm near Roblesdal. She had been strangled with her own shirt and it was determined that she had been lying in the open field for two weeks before farm workers discovered her body. Near her body, a shoe was found and it was thought that this shoe possibly belonged to the toddler's missing mother. Obviously, the task team didn't know about this new body yet, but they were going through the dockets of missing people in the area. One such docket concerned the disappearance of Daina Morulaneng Legolo, whose family reported her missing on the 27th of May. She had gone off with a man who had promised to give her a job and had not been seen or heard from since. In the missing persons docket, there was a cell phone number. It was assumed to be Dinah's cell phone number, so members of the task force decided to call it. When they did, a woman answered and told them that the phone had been given to her as a gift from her boyfriend, Petras Madiba. They told her that they wanted to talk to him about the recent murders in the area and she provided them with his whereabouts. When the investigating officers went to where she said he was, they found out that he was a migrant worker and had already left the farm for a new job at a different farm. He was just beyond their grasp and they had missed him by literally a few days. Luck was on their side, however, as it turned out that Petrus had not yet collected his payment. This allowed officers to set up a trap so that they could be there when he came to collect his money. When the police arrested him, they only knew of the first four murders, but once in custody, Petrus admitted to murdering eight women and a baby, and he told police that he was willing to point out the crime scenes. The first body that he pointed out was that of Libo Mokwena, the mother of the two-year-old found on the 13th of September. Mokwena was last seen alive on the 25th of August when she left home with her baby on her back. Next to be pointed out were the skeletal remains of Peggy Mankgele. She was last seen alive on the 5th of May, leaving her home with a man who had promised her work. Five days later, Pietrus pointed out the naked and decomposing body of Gloria Moshatoa, a woman he had worked with on a farm in Groblersdale. Witnesses reported that on the day of her disappearance, Moshe Toa went to town to buy a few items and she was accompanied by Pietrus. He returned to the farm alone. Two days later, Pietrus pointed out the last body, the body of the woman that ultimately led to his arrest, Dina Lecola. She was already almost completely decomposed, but the blue rope that had been used to restrain and murder her was clearly visible. The evidence against him was overwhelming. Not only did he point out all of the crime scenes, but he also had two of the victim's cell phones in his possession, one of which he had given to his girlfriend, along with clothing belonging to two other victims. There was also DNA evidence that connected him to at least one murder, so he kind of had no choice but to confess and plead guilty. So, <coughs> <laughs> he admitted to killing all of the women, but he told the courts that he had been provoked into doing so because all but two of the women had at some point been his girlfriend. Petrus claimed that he knew his first victim because they were in a relationship on the day of her murder. They got into an argument and he raped and strangled her to death. 
His second victim was apparently also his girlfriend. He killed her because she cheated on him and stole his money. He killed his third victim, who was also his girlfriend, because he had bought her a cell phone and on the day of her murder, a man had called the phone and when Petras answered the phone, the man swore at him. This resulted in him and his alleged girlfriend getting into a fight and he killed her. His fourth victim was also his girlfriend. According to Petras, she had led him to believe that they shared a child together and on the day of the murder, he found out that the child was not his and he killed the mother. He killed the child because the child was not his. Mugona's family refuted this claim, stating that she had never met Petrus and the first time that they had met was in fact on the day that he murdered her and her child. Petrus' sixth victim was surprisingly not his girlfriend, but he killed her because he had professed his love and she had rejected him and then sent people to steal his stuff. His seventh victim was also not a former girlfriend. According to Petrus, she had borrowed money from him but refused to pay it back so they got into a fight and he strangled her. His eighth victim was once again another girlfriend. They had a bad breakup and she, according to Petrus, burned his clothes and he got angry when she denied burning his clothes so he killed her too. Finally, Petrus claimed that he and his ninth victim had fallen in love but when she humiliated and lied to him, he killed her and left her naked in the field. According to Petrus, he had eight girlfriends, the seven that he had murdered and the one that he gave the phone to in the span of just seven months. His claims that all these women were lovers or girlfriends is beyond ridiculous. It's highly unlikely that he knew any of these women prior to murdering them, other than the one woman that he worked with on the farm. The twist that we mentioned earlier is not that Pietrus had an intimate relationship with all of his victims, it is far more mind-blowing than that. During the course of the investigation, and this was also confirmed by his own confession, it was discovered that at the time of his killing spree, Pietrus was actually on bail for murder. In November 2011, he was released on bail facing charges of a murder and rape that took place in Labouac, Gomo. He committed a murder, was let out on bail, then went on to kill nine other people. Before the serial murder case went to trial, the Labouac Gommel case was finalised and for that he was sentenced to 35 years imprisonment. For the serial murder cases he was charged with nine counts of murder, seven of aggravated robbery, one of rape and one of kidnapping. On the 18th of October 2013, Judge Bill Prinsloo sentenced Petrus Madiba to nine life sentences and additional 15 years imprisonment. He also told the Middleburg Circuit Court that Petrus would remain a threat to society for as long as he lives and should therefore serve his sentence subsequently to the 35 years he was already serving. Whilst listening to his sentence being handed down, Petrus began sobbing and even apologized to the families of his victims, saying that he was sorry that he had taken their loved ones away. The accused is sentenced to imprisonment for life. Asked if he had anything to say to the families, he responded. But then he also added that his victims had provoked him and basically laid the blame at their feet. Personally, I think this case is absolutely insane. I've never come across a serial killer case quite like it. I think that Pietrus was actually out on bail for murder and yet he went on to kill nine more. That just, like, 
is insane. Like, authorities shouldn't have allowed him to have bail for murder. I know in this country that the chances of getting bail over a murder charge is pretty much zero. Um, so personally, I don't think he should have been released at all because if he hadn't been, then nine lives could have been spared. And yeah, at the end of the day, I'm just glad that he has been put behind bars and justice is finally being served for all of his victims. Hi, it's Future Me editing me. So I was just thinking on what Kirsty said about how in her country the chances of being let out on bail when you are charged with murder are slim to none. And hmm, that's not the case in South Africa. You can be charged with a murder and get like 1,000 rands bail and you're out in a week. Or you can be convicted of a violent crime and be let out on parole. And it just makes me think of like the recent cases that we've seen in South Africa where children have been murdered by people that were out on parole after committing violent crimes. I just did a quick Google search and four different cases popped up. The one that actually like broke the, the lid on this whole situation is that of eight-year-old Tasne van Veek. Tasne van Veek disappeared from her home in Alsis River on the 7th of February of this year. And it turns out that she was murdered by someone who was out on parole. So I found an article about the circumstances of what happened. So I'll read to you like the first bit and then I'll link it down below so that you can read the rest. The man arrested in connection with the kidnapping and murder of eight-year-old Tasne van Veek absconded from parole a year before she went missing near her home in Ulsees River, Cape Town. Department spokesperson Singaba Kwanumalo said Moidian Tangaka had served half of a 10-year sentence for culpable homicide and kidnapping when he was granted parole, but he later disappeared. There are so many things wrong with that. There are so many things wrong. He got 10 years for culpable homicide and kidnapping. What the f and then he went on to kill an eight-year-old girl because obviously the law allowed him to do it. The reason that he got to do it is because the law was like, yeah, we don't care about the fact that you've got a criminal record, a violent criminal past 10 years for culpable homicide. He didn't even serve the full 10 years. He served five of those 10 years, absconded for a year. In that year that he was missing, that they didn't know where he was, uh, we don't even know if he killed more people than just Tasney because he was missing for a year. P police did not know where he was for a year. And this is not an isolated incident because another um, article from Cape Talk speaks on a different guy who murdered a 12-year-old girl. And just an insert from that article says that the four-year-old was found to have been out on parole for the rape and, att and attempted murder of an eight-year-old in early 2003. The victim, now 23, recalled her life-changing ordeal and explained how the suspect stabbed her multiple times and brutally raped her. She survived by pretending to be dead and rolling into the bushes and hiding. Third article is about Regan Gerza, and he was the same age as Tazne. He went missing in Tulbach after he was seen walking with a family member who'd recently been released from prison. Why? Why? You know what? You actually can't blame the community for allowing these types of people into their community because we, we don't know about their criminal past. We don't have a public sex offenders registry in South Africa. We don't have any of that. So you for for all you know that this guy went to prison for, I don't know, Dacha or something. But no, he went to prison for culpable homicide and rape and kidnapping. But we're going to let him out into the streets. We're going to let him around our children. So the last one that I wanted to talk about before we end this video is... Uh, this one is actually really heartbreaking and this one really pisses me off. It's about a 52-year-old Limpopo man that was charged with the murder of his four children. So this article was published on the 20th of February of this year and it reads, The Limpopo man is appearing in court on four charges of murder and will be remanded in custody, mm, I'm sure. The 52-year-old Limpopo man charged with the murder of his four children appeared in court on Thursday. He was arrested on Tuesday night near Burgos Fort after he confessed to a neighbor. Mojabelo, he's one of the investigating officers, says according to their preliminary profiling, the suspect was already serving a sentence for a previous child murder and was out on parole. I have, I have no words. 
I I actually have no words. How do we allow this? Why do we allow? Especially after September of 2000. Was that a fever dream? Was September of 2019 a fever dream for all women and children in South Africa? Because I don't think it was. I think it was like a real thing that highlighted a huge, huge problem in this country. But police... And law enforcement in general, they just held a couple of protests, they wrote a few letters, some memorandums, and they called it a day and they were like, yep, that's enough. We're just going to let murderers out on parole. That's what they did. But yeah, I'm going to end it here and cue outro. With all of that said, it does bring us to the end of this case and to the end of this video. I'm really interested to know what you guys think of this case, what you think about the DNA evidence, the forensic evidence being used in this case. It was the first time that DNA evidence was used to such an extent in a South African case. And there was news articles on news articles about DNA, especially in a town like Groblesdal. Before I say goodbye, I do want to give a huge, huge thank you to Kirsty for working with me on this case, for working with me on the videos that we did together. Thank you for letting me hop on your channel as well for the video that we did. If you haven't yet checked that out, please go ahead and do so. I will have it linked in the description box. If you are coming here from Kirsty's channel, thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate every single person that watched this video. If you found this video interesting and you enjoy the way that I presented this case, please do consider subscribing to my channel. For all my regular viewers as well, I do appreciate you guys with all of my heart. I love you so, so much. Once again, thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you in my next video, which I think will be on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys then. Don't forget to leave your comments and thoughts on this video. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye.